today i warmly welcome you all to the epg patshala and we will be dealing with a topic which is broadly under the rubric of indian culture and the paper is indian polity where i shouhik mukhopadhyay associate professor in kolkata university department of history will be dealing with a module which is focused on the taxation system of ancient south india now to begin with we should keep in mind importance of the taxation system particularly in the context of ancient south india and my presentation will cover the following topics as land revenue or the share of the produce taken because in the ancient south indian condition with the prevalence of agriculture economy was dependent on agriculture and land revenue became one of the most important aspects of taxation we will also be dealing with additional demands which pertains or falls within the land revenue system but uh it also covers things like maintenance of irrigation works payments to the village officers maintenance of temples and brahmins etc also we will be dealing with the modes of assessment as well as the units of measurement of the land which is very important to understand taxation we will also be dealing with the mode of collection and the non agricultural taxes <clears throat> before going into the nitty gritty details of ancient south indian taxation we should keep in mind importance accorded by the traditional indian political thinkers like say thiruvalluvar or kautilya of taxation in their overall scheme about the indian political system thiruvalluvar's tirukkural it is considered to be one of the classical documents of the traditional south indian uh, political tradition or wisdom there valluvar considers that the king that is swami uh, who possesses the following six components would be the greatest among the kings they are padai kudi kul amaichu nadpu and aran in which kul is considered as treasure so according to thiruvalluvar treasure is considered to be one of the very important one of the most important aspects of the uh, whole political system along with that we find that kautilya uh, he divides the state in the famous saptanga theory into seven components which comprises of swami amatya janapada uh, durga danda kosha and mitra where kosha is also treasury so in both the cases we find thiruvalluvar and kautilya they have considered treasure treasury to be a very important aspect of the state uh if we go into the vedic literature in the early vedic literature king's power was not clearly articulated taxation was occasional and voluntary king probably supported himself or dependent on occasional tributes to maintain his retinue and the meager administrative staff that he had but the situation changed through time so in the later vedic literature we find the king has been described as the eater of his subjects visammatta so uh, we find that slowly k 
king was becoming more important and he was pressurizing on the people to gather more and more taxes. Similarly, we find uh, people like Bhagaduga and Samakta who dealt with taxation, they have figured among the Ratnins during the time of coronation ceremony. As we proceed through time, we find that further developments take place in the context of taxation. So, from the Mauryan period, we find more and more evidences on taxes and the sources of taxation. In the later Gupta period, in the Christian era or the common era, we find that uh, they have imposed uh, or we get more and more information about the taxation because they talk about the religious grants and in the religious grants sometimes they talk about the taxes which the grantee did not have to pay. So from those lists of the parihara that is the taxes which has been exempted from payment to the doni from this list we can have a much more clear idea much more well-rounded idea about the taxes that is meant to be paid in the uh, so this gives us an idea about the situation uh, in general prevailing in india and now we will be directly entering into the south indian taxation system south india is unique within india because of the abundance of the inscriptional evidences if we take the case of the cholas singularly we find that the number of the published inscriptions the range over 5000 and the number of the unpublished inscriptions they run over 10,000. So, we have enormous amount of inscriptional evidences to study the revenue system. And this is not just the case of the Cholas, but when we talk about the other South Indian uh, dynasties, we find the same thing uh, takes place. Now, because of this abundance of the primary sources, we, we find that historians have dealt about the South Indian revenue system extensively. Doyans of South Indian history like Kallidai Kurichi Ayya Ayyar Nilaganta Shastri or T.V. Mahalingam or A. Appadurai or A. S. Altekar, they have written extensively on the subject of South Indian taxation. However, their approach had a problem in the sense that they were amalgamating all the sources in a place without that is we can say that it was a kind of random sampling they were not focusing on the specific speciality and temporality of a particular uh, inscription or sources. This problem has been removed by the recent uh, historical researches of Professor Y. Subarayalu or Professor Noburu Karashima, Professor P. Shanmugam and others and this has resulted in the better understanding of the overall South Indian revenue system. Now, Though I am talking about the ancient South Indian uh, revenue system, I am focusing mainly on the Tamil country because of the prevalence of the ins uh, inscriptions or the primary sources. And there we can begin with the revenue terms as found in the Pallava charters. Pallavas, who were one of the most important dynasties in the peninsular India, particularly in the deep south, there in their 
charters, both the Prakrit and the Sanskrit uh, charters, we come across a wide ranging revenue terms. In most of the cases, they were part of the religious grants, illimocinary grants, granted to different religious institutions and uh, individuals like the Brahmins. And there, in their uh, donation charter, we find name of the taxes as parihara or exemption from which the doni was exempted. There, the name of a long list of taxes come, uh, we come across. For instance, alona gula chobham. This is a tax imposed on salt manufacture because salt was considered to be the royal monopoly. Or say for instance, apara param balivadam. This was imposed as a kind of uh, obligation for furnishing drought animals to the uh, royal officers who have come for a visit. It, it is similar to the term nallarudu, that is good bull, which we come across in the Tamil portions of the later Pallava grants. Now, <clears throat> the list continues. For instance, Ilampucci. It comprises of two parts, Ilam and Pucci. It was tax on the toddy drawers. Idai Pucci. Duty imposed on the Idayar, that is the cattle breeders. Brahmana Rakshanam. This was tax possibly paid by the priests to the king. Kalyana Kanakam. Kanakam or Kannala Kanakam, which was a kind of payment for conducting marriage or the, when the marriage was conducted, the king or the state has to be paid a small amount. Kusakana, that is contribution by the potters or potter of the village. There are other lists like Tattakaya or Tattarpattam, which was a fee imposed on the goldsmith. Visakkana, that is Viavan, the village headman, the dues to the village headman, which uh, he earned because of his duties, defraying his responsibilities, this was known as Visakkana. Paraikana, this was tax imposed on the washerman who utilized water from the public tanks or made use of the stones placed on the public land. Pudagavile, that is fees levied on the sellers of the tax. Potigaikana, that is tax on the ferry. Patigai, which means boat or tax on the ferryman. Taragu, brokerage fee levied on the middleman of all trade. Sekku, which was duty on the oil press. Not all villages they were allowed to have uh, oil presses. Those who wanted to have oil press in their village, they had to pay a kind of fee for having oil press in their village. Tari or Tarikurai, it was tax charged on the weavers which is distinct from Pudagavile. Then Padamkali, that is professional tax on the spinners, in which was paid in the form of cotton thread. Patinacheri, all dues payable by the fishermen. Fishermen were known as Patinavar. So the Patinavars or the Patinavar uh, villages, they had to pay this kind of tax. Then there was Tiru Mukha Khanam, which was the made for bringing the royal writ, 
Tirumukham is the royal writ, royal order. If you wanted to have a royal order in your village, it is a kind of postage or a kind of conveyance charge that the state uh, exacted from the individual villages which got that royal order. Nadu Vagai. Nadu Vagai was portion of the share from the village which was payable to the Nadu which was the superior authority. Katikanam uh, that is tax on the blacksmiths imposed for their making different kinds of weapons. Echuru. Echuru was a compulsory feeding of those who came to collect land tax that is a kind of obligation, compulsory obligation on the part of the villagers to feed the government officials when they came to the villages on visit. Manrupadu, Manram in the classical Tamil literature is known to be the uh, um, village assembly place which later came to be known as a kind of uh, court. So, the, uh, mm, uh, the fines being imposed in the court itself, it became part of a tax which was known as Manru Padu. After the end of the Pallava period, by 850 CE, common era, the imperial Chola rule started in Tamil Nadu. As we know that they had an enormous number of inscriptions already I have referred to it and if we go through the Chola inscriptions we come across numerous names of the taxes. Around 400 tax names we come across which is considerably more than the Pallava period. Uh, Noburu Karashima and B. Sitaraman in their concordance of Chola tax terms have shown that despite this huge number of taxes, there were seven taxes which were the most numerous and distributed and most frequently uh, exacted by the state. They are Kadamai or Irai that is the main land tax, Kudimai, Antarayam, Vetti, Muttayal and Tattarpattam. These are the most frequently used or employed taxes uh, during the time of the Chodas. Now, if we uh, go through these revenue terms, we can broadly classify them under four major categories. One, the primary land tax, which was variously known as Irai or Kadamai or Opati. Then there were labor services denoted by the term Kudimai, which was levied from the cultivators. Here I will stop and try to explain the difference between Kadamai and Kudimai because Kadamai was mainly imposed on the land owners. They might not be or necessarily be the cultivators themselves. Possibly they were employing the tenants or the actual cultivators for the uh, agriculture. So the land tax Kadamai was imposed on the land owners whereas the people who actually cultivated the land that is the real cultivators of the Ulukudi, they were paying the Kudimai. Then there were taxes on various non-agricultural professions, mainly known by the generic term Pattam or Ayam. For instance, Tattar Pattam, that is the tax imposed on the goldsmiths. And then there were miscellaneous taxes, including presents, tolls on the merchandise, that is customs duties or the judicial fines. So there were basically four types of taxes.
Now, if we deal with the Kadamai, which was the major or main land tax, we find that it was paid by the Kani Alar, the landlord. Kani, that is the land or the owner, and the Kani Alar, that is the land owner, he has to pay the tax to the government. Also, it should be noted that the rent paid by the tenant or the cultivator whom I have referred to, they, their payment of the rent to the land owner that was also known as Kadamai or Melvaram. But if we look into the inscription itself, it is not very difficult to distinguish between the tax paid to the state and the rent paid to the land owner. So, this is the main land tax that, uh, that was there during the time of the Cholas, that is the um, Kadamai. Then we have to deal with Kudimai. Kudimai was levied directly from the actual producer or cultivator who was known as the Ulukudi. Kudimai compro comprised of a number of labor levies like 1. Vetti, 2. Amanji, then Motayal, Vettinai, which is equivalent to the Sanskrit term Vetana. It also am amounted to or had Korvi, that is the first or compulsory labor rendered by the actual cultivator for maintenance of irrigation tanks channels and river banks which was very essential for the upkeep of the agricultural system. They were denoted by the terms like Al Amanji. Now Al Amanji or it could be sometimes for a very temporary period which was denoted by the term Mutayar or sometimes it is the compound form of Chenir Veti and Velan Veti. If we further go into the Kudimai thing or we deal with the other aspects of uh, the Kudimai system, we find that several other taxes were also imposed like Nir Vilay, that is upkeep of the water sources which could have been a commuted payment. Kattar, Kadu, the forest. It is this tax was rendered for clearing or removing of the forests. Vedini, which also indicated compulsory labor which was used during the initial period of the Cholas. In addition to it, there was evening meals or rice which was compulsory to be provided by the Kudi people when the public servants, either local or the visiting, they were coming to the villages which is almost synonymous or almost same like the Pallava term Echoru. Then there were Tevai which was a free labor provided during the seasonal festivals. Also, during the high noon of the Chola imperialism, forced labor was sometimes commuted in the form of Pandaveti or cash. That is, you don't have to or you are not required to provide with the labor, but you can pay the pay in lieu, in lieu of your labor, you pay the cash. That also was possible. If we come to the fourth. Uh, third aspect of the revenue system that is Patam and Ayam. This third group was mostly imposed on either the artisans like the blacksmiths, goldsmiths, etc., or the merchants. Sometimes a comprehensive term Antarayam was imposed or became popular in the second half of the Chola rule. 
the Cholas, they ruled for almost 400 years from 850 to 7, uh, 1279. This 400 years to have a better assessment of the inscriptional evidences has been divided into four sub periods and the first half we can consider as the initial period and the second half when the Chola empire was st started to crumbling, crumbling down. Antarayam became popular in the second half of the Chola rule. And sometimes this term overlaps with Kadamal. In the fourth uh, aspect of the taxes, we have service taxes like Padi Kaval, that is taxes provided to some officers or some individuals who provided with certain kind of taxes, uh, certain kind of services. Padi Kaval, this was a tax which was given to the Kaval people who were actually providing with the policing duty and maintaining law and order in the villages. Padi Kaval became very important in the later half of the Chola period. Now, to go along with the revenue system, first to have a good assessment, we should have land survey. In the Tamil mathematical works like Kanaka Adhikaram, there are one or two chapters which is devoted to land measurement. So from these type of treaties, we find that land measurement was taught when mathematics was being taught at the school or the higher level. Also, we come across the terms like Tiru Ulahaland, that is who that surveyed the world or who surveyed the world. It is believed that there were extensive land surveys during the time of Raja Raja 1, Kulutunga 1 and others. Though we don't have very specific information about country-wide cadastral surveys being done, but the first systematic land survey was done on the 16th regnal year of Raja Raja 1, that is in 1001 CE. How to do the measurement? For that, we should have measuring units and in the Chola inscriptions, we come across several terms like Kuli, Ma, Veli, Patti or Patakam. Patti was found only in the northern districts of Tamil Nadu, that is Chengalpat, North and South Arcot districts and the adjoining districts of Andhra. By 11th century, it became obsolete. The unit Patakam can be found only in few Brahmadeya villages in different parts of the study area. So, we can conclude that Kuli and Feli, they were the most popular units. Kuli was the smallest and other units like Veli, Patakam or Patti were expressed in multiples of this unit, Kuli. The largest standard unit was Veli. The term Veli can be found in early Tamil literature from 1st to 3rd century CE, that is in Sangam, and it appeared in the early Pandyan inscriptions, that is 8th to 9th century. In some form or other, Veli continues to the days of the British rule because in one of the district manuals, we find almost equivalent or equivalence between Veli and the 
new unit being used during the time of the British rule. There was no uniform reckoning of these units. In different parts of the country, different reckonings of the same unit could have been used. So there was attempt to impose kind of standardization of the different units or the same uh, different reckonings of the same unit. However, we can conclude that one patti was equivalent to thousand kuli. Patagam, it had different reckonings. Within Uttaramerur village, which is very famous for its inscriptions on the Brahmin led Sabha. Within Uttaramerur, we find three different reckonings of the same Patagam. And though the name is same, the area covered by the Patagam during the time of the Guptas and the Patagam used in Uttaramerur or in South India, it was not same. It was much smaller than the Patagam used during the Gupta period. There was same disparity between the Veli and Kuli. So Veli Kuli interrelations had to be standardized. It has been suggested by uh, the historians like Vaisu Barayalu that there were basically two reckonings that is, one Veli equal to 2000 Kuli or one Veli equal to 2560 kuli and this can be considered to be the basic units of measurement. One veli equal to 2000 kuli was the Choda standard measurement unit or interrelation introduced during the time of 11th century and it can be found confined in core region of the Choda rule. And the primary fraction of the veli was 1 20th of the veli was expressed by 1 ma, 1 80th of a veli was expressed by the term kani, 3 20th portion of 1 veli was expressed by the term muntiri. Land was measured by rod or pole which was known as coal. Generally, it was based on a human span, chan or foot, adi. And there are instances like 19 chan coal or 12 adi coal. 12 adi coal, which was possibly introduced from the time of Vikrama Chola during the time of 1100 CE, it became very very popular or it it became the most dominant uh, measuring uh, system 16 span rod human span rod was popular but it was confined in the northern districts only and as i was telling that there was a attempt to standardize we find in a particular inscription from manimangalam uh, in Chengalpattu district during the time of Jatavarman Sundara Pandya in uh, 1262, there was famine conditions prevailing. So, to give them a relief, to give the peasants a relief, a new uh, measuring uh, unit was introduced, that is, 16 feet uh, was introduced, which was simply known as Pada Kol. It is not only necessary to have measurement, but there are different types of lands. So, for the purpose of taxation, gradation of or classification of different varieties of land was necessary. On the basis of the availability of the irrigation facility, a land which is very near to the river or to a tank, fertility of the soil and number of crops raised either it is a double crop 
land or it is a single crop land or it produces three crops a year. On the basis of these variety of uh, conditions, we find land was being classified. There were 20 classifications of land prevalent during the time of Kulotunga. Taram was used to denote grade or sort and Taram appears in the inscriptions from 950 CE onwards. We come across terms like Taram Che or Taram Peru uh, which means to do Taram that is to classify the lands and these statistics of lands of different varieties they were recorded in the book or the register which was known as Tarapottavam which was preserved in each village and on the available inscriptions it seems that the first grade the best quality land it was known as Talai Varisai it paid taxes 2.5 times more than the fourth grade now um, if we go farther we find that uh, the collection of the land during the initial period imperial cholas they uh, during the initial period of the imperial cholas means from 850 ce common era to 1070 uh, to 986 ce during the initial period possibly tax was 120 column of grain or paddy per valley for the standard land which was river irrigated and produced two crops a year with the accession of Raja Raja 1 when from the period when the Chola imperialism the high noon of Chola imperialism starts the standard was 100 column per valley and it came into vogue only on the lands producing two crops annually known as Iruppu twice flowering lands for the other paddy lands irrigated by tanks or wells the rate was generally ranged between 20 and 50 column per valley less than 20 column per valley must have been imposed on dry crop lands here i will just stop and say that the gradation of the land there this distinction between the wet land and the dry land is very important wetland means the land which had benefits of irrigation either river or tank or wells and others and the dry land was completely dependent on the seasonal precipitation that is rainfall land tax imposed on the wetlands with irrigation facility was possibly taken in kind that is in paddy itself however for the dry lands tax was normally taken in cash and the land tax from commercial settlements which was known as nagaram was always commuted in money tax which was imposed and taken in kind obviously had to be collected in two installments kara that is the short term harvested in september or february and between september and february and pasanam that is long term which where the crop was harvested in january or february so there was two times when state came for uh, claiming the taxes 
and the accounting year possibly began from the Pasanam season. Apart from the regular taxes, state was empowered to impose extra taxes because of some exigency. For instance, during the time of Veera Rajendra, he imposed extra or additional tax of one Kalanju gold coins per will for fighting war with the Eastern Chalukyas, the Vengi Chalukyas, which was similar to the kind of taxes imposed by the Rashtrakutas known as the Turushka Danda when they were fighting with the invading uh, Arabs. In Arthashastra, this is or this was denoted by the term pranay. So, there was a system of imposing additional taxes. During the second half of the imperial cholas, when the chola imperial system started crumbling down, we find that the Brahmana settlements, the Chaturvedi Mangalam or uh, Mangalams, they had to pay full tax, which never happened earlier because they were exempted from paying taxes. And to pay the tax, sometimes there was forced or distressed sale of land, which is recorded in the inscriptions. In the 12th and 13th century, we also have instances of confiscation of land by the for the government tax areas or sale of the same in public auction which was known as Peruvile. Uh, so by the end of the Chola period or by the beginning of the uh, end we find that the incidence of tax it was increasing and because of the additional imposts not only the tax that I have referred to which was imposed during the Veera Rajendra period but also because of the imposition of the Padikaval taxes, the people, the Brahmin settlements, they were forced to sell their land and this was bought by some other people. Because of this additional imposition, there was resistance as well, which is also recorded in the inscriptions. For instance, in the Tanjore district, we have instance of resistance made by the people against the additional imposition. Apart from the taxes, we also, when discussing the tax system or taxation system, we also should keep in mind that there was a system of remissions. The term Iraeli means tax-free land where government relinquished its demand in favor of the temples or the religious bodies and this was known by this term. However, the loss made by the state, it was not complete because the donies, they had to pay part of the earlier tax into the government treasury or the coffers. This reduced rate was known as panchavaram that is one-fifth share of the old thing. Also we come across terms like kodi ninga devadana land which has been donated to the temples sometimes they were granted along with the original tenant cultivators remaining in the land or sometimes it was Kudinikki Devadana where the original cultivators were evicted possibly after paying some kind of compensation. Also there are instances of a large number of remissions recorded for variety of reasons like scarcity of water, flood, plunder, ruined condition of the village, desertion of the land made by the 
presence because of some reasons or the land being filled up by the sand due to the vicinity of sea or sometimes during the time of the king's coronation that is on some ceremonial locations also there were remissions of taxes. In the case of crop failure due to natural calamity, it was within the rights of the village assembly, sabha or the people of the village, they could appeal for remission. There are also instances where quantum of the existing tax was relaxed by changing the length of the measuring rod which I have just now referred when talking about the measuring or the measurement of the system. So, uh, it was at least in that case during the time of Jatavarmana Sundar Pandya, it was thought that by changing the length of the measuring rod, the quantum of the tax can be reduced and this could prove beneficial for the cultivators. Uh, now, how the tax was collected? In the case of the joint tenure, for instance, the land under the jurisdiction of Sabha, state did not deal directly with the peasants. It was under the jurisdiction, jurisdiction of the Sabha and they had wide ranging power of collecting revenue, uh, selling the land of the defaulters and others. In the villages which did not fall under joint tenure, where headman of the village was entrusted with the responsibility of apportioning the demand, state demand, among the several landholders, Kanyalar, whom we have referred to earlier. These type of villages were known as the Vellan Vagai village. And uh, there, the headman was responsible for getting the tax uh, taxes from the people. Sometimes, when the land was donated to temples or individuals like the officials in the case of Padikaval, state thought that the grantee who has been granted with the land or the assignee who has been assigned with the revenue, they were expected to make the arrangements for collecting the revenue. So, with this we conclude about the land revenue system and now we can come to the other taxes, particularly the customs duties. If we go through a very important inscription found at Motupalli, inscribed during the time of Ganapati Deva, who was a Kakatiya ruler, and this inscription was famously known as Abhaya Sasana, we find that there is a long list of different items and the customs duties imposed on those items which have been imported or which were being or going to be exported. From there, we find that rose water, ivory, shavet, camphor oil, copper, zinc, lead, silk threads, corals, perfumes, they paid 11 by 4 plus 1 by 8 panam on each pagoda fan, sandal, they had a tax of 1 pagoda for 11 by 4 panam on 1 tola. Whereas the Chinese camphor and the pearls, they were 3 fourth and 3 eighth of a pan. So, before ending, looking into the customs duties, I will also tell you that 
the instance of Mattupalli, this is very important where the ruler of the land, in, the, in this case the Kakatiya ruler, he is remitting customs duties to invite, to bring the foreign traders to his land. So, this was a kind of incentive being given to the traders for coming to his land. It was not simply the case of Ganapati Deva. Ganapati Deva was not unique. But in the time of the Chola, Chola rule, Kulatunga Chola, he was famously known as Sungam Tavidit Chola, the king who has remitted Sungam customs duties or taxes to invite the foreign traders to his land. So, the king, this is a practice or this was a practice in the ancient period for remitting certain kind of customs duties to invite people to one's land, particularly the traders. To end with, through this module, we have looked into certain things like one, Land revenue was paid by the land owners, Kani Alar, who were owning the land even if they were not cultivating it in their own hands or giving it to the tenant cultivators. There was a very elaborate system of land measurement. The actual cultivators who actually cultivated the land known as Ulukudi, they paid through labor levies known by the term, generic term Kudimai. Taxes were remitted for various reasons. By the end of the Chola period, there was a widespread discontent and protests by the people against excesses of taxation imposts like Padi Kaval and there were the system of relaxation of the customs duties which was used to attract foreign investments particularly during the time of Kulotunga Chola and Ganapati Deva of the Kakatiya dynasty. Thank you.